All right, so I'm going to take you back to uh, Sesame Street here. One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> and the big trick is to getting people to understand that the one thing that is not like the other is not the girl who is human. She's not the different one. You know, all of these people are, uh, they're all wearing clothes, they're all obviously happy with their jobs or whatever they're doing. They're very, you know, they're obviously smiling. Uh, and they're all vertebrates, they're all mammals, they're all amniotes and so forth. And three of them are primates, one is not. And so that's the odd one out. And a lot of people have a little trouble making this distinction until they look at the entire rest of the animal kingdom or really all types of life. And what do we have here? We have the same sort of thing. We have one of these things is not like the other. We have a sheep and a goat, they're both very close to each other. They're both, uh, they're both, uh, Artiodactyls, they're both ruminants. Artiodactyls meaning that they have the hooves in the split ways, and ruminants meaning that they have multi chambered stomachs. And of course, then we have a hyena, which is neither a dog nor a cat, but in the carnivore line. And we know that the hyena is more closely related to the sheep and the goat than any of them are to this monitor lizard down there. Even though the monitor lizard is carnivorous, it is not a carnivore. That's a different classification that includes only mammals. So when Carolus Linnaeus uh, this is a, anybody familiar with him? He's a Swedish botanist originally. Uh, and he started to try to classify not just all the plants that he was studying, he tried to classify all life forms. And he discovered this, there were several successive tiers. What he was expecting to find was a, a collection of different boxes for what creationists today call different kinds of life. And he wasn't seeing that. Instead, he was seeing what he, what he was portraying as a uh, like a set of Russian Matryoshka dolls where everything is inside a series of ancestral sets, daughter groups within ancestral sets. And where this got confusing in addition to that was when you take uh, you know, like um, every genus of uh, like of Philidae all belong within the same family but more than that they all belong in the same uh, parent, I can even read these here. Yeah, that is blurry. And the same class, the same order, the same phylum, the same kingdom. Why did they have this kind of ancestral trait? And when you add another species, you discover a branching tree pattern, which creationists today are still desperately trying to deny. But this is something that Linnaeus happened across, and this did not make sense from a creationist standpoint. He could not explain this, but he detected this branching tree pattern. We're only looking at two species here. Obviously, the more species you look at, the more branches there are, and it gets a little bit ridiculous. Uh, and we've discovered pretty soon that his seven boxes, these uh, seven uh, Russian dolls that he had, didn't actually work because there's way more divisions than that. So this is a drawing by, um, this is one of Darwin's contemporaries. This was Ernst Haeckel. Now, Ernst Haeckel was kind of the Bill Nye, the science guy of his time. He was a very well-respected science communicator. He was more of an artist than he was a scientist, and this unfortunately was his downfall, uh, as he got, a, he got a bad press rap in the 1990s, where some people were, were questioning his credentials, or not his credentials, his ethics and his tactics in some of his drawings, and it turned out that much of the bad press that Ernst Haeckel got was in the way that he was being misportrayed a couple of hundred years later. They were taking, he was famous for having done these drawings of different embryos back before they had photography, right? He would, he would get on the microscope and he would draw these. And he drew them without maternal material, without yolks and all like this. He had everything turned the same way. It was all in the same angle, all in the same angles for means of comparison. And unfortunately, other people later on did micro photographs where they sometimes included these things or to used parabolic lenses in one case, but not all, and changed some of the, the configurations and said that his, the, the little eccentricities of his drawings were enhancing other details. And their studies actually showed that not only would, they, would this have incriminated Heckel, but it also would have incriminated his creationist opponents at the same time because they put on two strict limits such that eliminated everybody and then the people, the very people that were accusing Ernst Haeckel of being a dishonest misrepresenter backed off their allegations saying that his work was actually very valuable to science and that, you know, that there were some things that they were upset about or that, that they considered tangent and tangent, whatever. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, contentious, let's say. That wasn't the word that they used, but they, they agreed that his work was actually valid 
uh, overall. And he actually had, uh, as I said, in his time, he had mountains named after him on multiple continents. He was a very well-respected science communicator. And he came up with this tree, which doesn't adequately represent the long string of relationships, because here we have very short branches that lead to a central trunk. And of course, the tree of life isn't really like that. There really isn't a trunk. It's just a continuous series of branches. And some people would like to refer to the tree of life more like a tumbleweed, which is kind of the way I look at it. Now, I had an advantage over other people growing up in this culture in that uh, my family was Mormon and they had my particular Mormon family had this uh, tradition that you don't indoctrinate a ch child in religious practice until they are what they arbitrarily decide was the age of reason, which was for me eight years old. So I was free of religious indoctrination until that point. Now, by then I'd already been to second grade and some teachers recognized that not like every other little boy that I had an interest in dinosaurs and stuff. So they gave me one of my, my second grade school, uh, science teacher gave me a dinosaur book and in that dinosaur book was a cladogram of what they, I think they used, I don't remember what kind of chart they used to call it. I think it's phylogenetic chart, but anyway, it's a lot, heavily illustrated. So it's easy for a child to understand. And as I'm flipping through the pages and I happen to cross this cladogram, I see how all, you know, birds are linked to reptiles and how all tetrapods are linked together. And it just sort of clicked. This makes sense. So then on my eighth birthday, my mother comes in with a Bible and starts telling me that this is the absolute incontrovertible word of God. And I remember my initial response was, no, it isn't. See what it says here? You know. <laughs> so I was never a creationist. It was a long time when I was a Christian. It was a long time when I believed in all kinds of supernatural woo and poppycock and neo-paganisms and all of that. But I was never a creationist. I always understood evolution, I think, from day one. This is a better representation, a more modern representation than the simple cladogram I just showed you. And this was done by a guy in Finland uh, in Helsinki named Miko. And it's an exhaustive piece of work. This is the way that cladograms used to be represented. Now, in order to draw this out, of course, you have to have, you have to set your font to Courier New, and you have to pound in all the spaces so that everything lines up exactly right. And so you, you can see it looking at all this page, and I don't know if you can see all the, intro, the, all the tiny little detail about all the vertical blocks and then the little curly lines and then have to go to the dotted lines and everything has to match up exactly right. So if you ever realize that, oops, I forgot something, I need to change something, you will be there a month. And now if we look at these, I don't know if you can, you can't see these surely. So the top category there is called synapsida. This is, we, we're starting in the tree, nowhere near the root. We're, we, we ages past that point. We are starting now at where reptiles begin to divide from what will become mammals, okay? So synapsids are what we are. Uh, a synapsid is identified as having a, a, a temporal fenestra or a hole in the side of the skull. And in ours, it is filled in, but the, the image of it is still there in what we call the temple. You can still see that. Uh, so just because, you have lo just because that trait has filled back in doesn't mean that we are no longer synapsids, that we no longer have that, so we don't meet that category. Because you, the way that we classify all life forms is you have all of these traits building up to this point, and then you add this other trait, to become this new clade, or you can also add the subtraction of a trait and still become that clade. And for, this is the way that uh, snakes, for example, are still considered tetrapods, even though most of them don't have any legs anymore. There are some in the fossil record that do, and they, they obviously couldn't use them. Interestingly though, although we know that snakes once could walk around, we're pretty sure they could never talk. Now down from Synapsida we have Pelicosauria, and this is the classification where we have things like Demetrodon, so that gives you a kind of context in time, if you know anything about paleontology. paleontology. Detrometrodon was something, a crocodile-sized thing with a great big fin on it. Hopefully you guys know what I'm talking about. This was not a dinosaur, uh, neither was it a traditional reptile. I mean, it certainly wasn't like a lizard. A lot of people have colloquial definitions that don't really apply here. So it may look reptilian as hell, but it's not a reptile. And then going down a little bit further, uh, we have, let's see, the, uh, you probably can't even see that. There's one highlighted down there called Therapsida. The therapsids 
were a group of reptiles that were becoming increasingly what we traditionally identified as reptiles. The traditional definition being a cold-blooded, scaly thing with claws and, uh, and, and uh, lays eggs and has four limbs. But there are, there are universally accepted reptiles that don't have claws, that don't have legs, that don't, have, that don't lay eggs, that, that aren't cold-blooded, and don't have scales. So we have to classify by the ancestry of the thing rather than the current traits. If a person is defined as having two arms and two legs and all of these other features, and, is, and a child is born that doesn't have all of those features, is that child any less human, right? And we still have, we have to classify the child by their ancestry, right? So this is what phylogenetics is about. Therapsids are where we begin a long transition from what we would traditionally recognize as reptiles into what we universally accept as mammals, and there's a long division of lots of different intermediaries. So the creationists are always saying, well, where's the transitional species? This whole page right here. And if we click on Therapsida, this whole page, and it goes on. Uh, going down here to the bottom link, which I'm sure you can't read, is Cynodontia, which is a classification of mammal-like reptiles where they have canines. And interestingly, canines are a trait that is on everybody's ancestry. Some horses still have canines. It's an atavism. It doesn't show up on all of them. So, I mean, only occasionally will you have a horse skull that still has the fangs, but it does still happen. So sometimes a lost trait will sometimes re reappear. Usually with an atavism, it only happens in the developmental stages in the very young stages, but you know, it still happens with adult horses too, that they still have fangs. And of course, we even have some saber-toothed deer uh, still wandering around here and there. So we click on Cynodontia, and we get down through the list of categories. We get to the bottom one, it's called u Cynodontia, which means the new Cynodonts. And each one of these intermediates, each one of these named species is another transitional form of all the transitionals that they, have, they never found yet, but there's, there's hundreds of them here. And clicking further, uh, now you probably can't see down at the bottom of these, this is getting into what we would recognize as mammals. Still egg laying, but mostly recognized as mammals. And then finally we get into the bottom category on this page, and we, we notice we've gone through like four pages of transitional forms before we finally get to something recognized as mammal. And then of course, as you can imagine, there's huge divisions within mammals. So all of these, everything you just saw is a transitional species. And you saw this tree, you know, people will say, well, you know, can you show me a lizard turning into a dog? Well, yeah, but you're gonna have to be here a while. And yeah, we can show all the intermediates you like because this is where they all are. Now, uh, here we go again. Now we're dividing mammals up and there's lots of different categories. It used to be that what we're like right now, we have three different classifications of mammals. We have eutherians, which is everybody in this room, ideally. And then we have marsupials and monotremes. And the monotremes are not the chimeras that the creationists make them out to be. The monotremes are actually the oldest of mammals, the ones with the most reptilian traits, the ones that still lay eggs. So if one of them happens to have developed a leather-like bill that superficially looks like a duck bill, it does not mean that it has any genes from a bird, just to clarify that. So we're gonna click on one of these lower, uh, Australophenida, okay, <laughs> and hol Holotheria, and we're, we're just more and more subcategories of mammals. All of these, again, are transitional species, moving out of the egg laying, moving out of where they, they sweat milk from mammary glands to actually having nipples and more complex features like this, because all of this is incremental. All of evolution is just superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities. And it's each of these new superficial traits, mostly on the surface. Rarely do you ever get something fundamental. Rarely do you ever get something developmental. It happens, but it's, it's a rare occurrence. Most of these are the superficial surface changes. And to give an example of that, if you were to strip a tiger and a lion down to their skeletal form, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but you can certainly see them when the flesh is on the bones, right? Likewise, any colubrid snake is going to look exactly identical to any other colubrid snake when you look at the skeleton, but when it's the living animal, then it's completely different colors and patterns and lifestyle capabilities and so forth. This is a, modern, a more modern update of that old cladogram. Now, you saw how educational Miko's classification was, all the, all the work that he had to go into it. If you ever had to make a change, which is often especially when they started compiling phylogenetic data, when they started, when they mapped the genome and they started realizing, hey, this isn't where it goes, right? Then we started having to make changes and Miko just kind of went mad. 
<laughs> because you know, paste, space, 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 plus. <laughs> so what he had to do, so he, he longed for a system that would enable him to just move a node and have all the daughters of that node move with it. Now the daughters of the node, let's say the node is called a clade, that's the official name, right? And then when you take that all of the, what a clade is, is any taxonomic classification that includes all its descendants. Now the, the classification that I gave you for reptile, you know, scaly thing with cold blood and claws and all like this, we know that there's exceptions to each one of these things. So if we're starting to make exceptions for, you know, anything that's descended from these except these, well, the, the exception is proving the rule. So we're gonna to have to, we're gonna be monophyletic. Everything that descended from a reptile is gonna be considered a reptile. Consequently, because people have the wrong idea about what a red reptile is, we no longer refer to dimetrodon as a reptile. That's a synapsid. And you're still synapsids, it's just so that you're not confused. Yes, that means we're all fish. Because the word fish doesn't really have a taxonomic definition. You could use the word chordate instead of fish if you wanna make sense to people. But otherwise, there's no clear taxonomic definition of fish, and people get confused about that all the time. Uh, when I was a kid, for example, the orca up here was called a breathing fish. <laughs> they were actually adults that I knew as a child who believed that whales were fish and couldn't understand why, they, why didn't they have gills. You know, this was a mystery for them. And uh, in this cladogram, you can see that there's a number of things, well, you can't see that, uh, but there's a number of things that had to be changed. This is the Arizona Tree of Life Project. It is currently uh, for what is already published, the best resource for taxonomy, for phylogenetic classification there is. But it was a peer-reviewed tool that ran out of funding back in 2000 before they even finished the, the mapping the human genome project. So when they started picking up speed and mapping other things, they started finding that occasionally, you know, I mean, you usually have confirmation. It's exactly what you'd expect it to be. But in a few instances, there were surprises. There were genetic surprises. Like in this list, I showed a, in another video, I showed a number of uh, differences. Like they, they, they found pangolins and aardvarks and anteaters. And they realized that all of these three mammals had no teeth. So they assumed that they were related closely to each other if they put them all in the same classification. But then when they got the genome back, they realized, no, this is... This is a coincidental thing that they all don't have teeth. It really doesn't mean anything because the aardvarks are actually more closely related to elephants. And if you're looking at an aardvark closely, you can kind of see it. Pangolins are a huge mystery because they're all covered in scales, but they're more closely related to carnivores than anything else. And then you have the anteaters that are actually well, just anteaters. We'll just leave those there. A handful of changes need to be made. Now, if we click on primate, which is one of the subgroups here, we can see the group to which we belong. And again, there's some, some traditional classifications that aren't really working here because they'll put in monkeys and apes and people, which doesn't really work. And I'll explain why that is. You can't put monkeys and apes and people. Kind of, those are all kind of the same thing. It's like putting mallards and ducks and birds. <laughs> Would it make sense to put like that? Or dachshunds and dogs. And you know, if you want to find a transitional species, I always challenge people to show me a half dachshund, half dog. And you can find one halfway between Los Angeles and California. <laughs> this is the landing page for the Arizona Tree of Life Project. And as I said, this was an excellent tool, but it's no longer peer reviewed. It's no longer being funded. It was put together by a handful of PhDs and, did, and it's excellent work that they did, but it serves as a template for something else that we should be doing now. And I'm proud to say that a number of years ago, after, after these people lost funding, I started pitching for an idea of my own that was doing something very similar, but that allowed us to move those nodes like we were talking about. Every time something needed to be corrected. So what this was and what the next project is, is a encyclopedic depiction or illustration of the entire phylogenetic tree of life as a navigable online encyclopedia with hopefully, eventually, it's a work in progress, but it'll have all the information that this group hit, did and we intend to make it peer reviewed. This was our first incarnation of that. This was the Phylogeny Explorer Project, phase one. This was done about two years ago, and it took a year and a half for the database engineer to design it, the first database engineer. And it looked pretty good. I was fairly happy with it until we started loading data into it. And it went <laughs> So it was another year of development before we had another database engineer. And you can see nice bold lines. It's very easy to read. Unfortunately, we couldn't keep that because of the volume of data we're trying to put in. And you, as you'll see later, it becomes, if you, on an expanded view, it just becomes a black mess. So this 
is what the cladogram looks like now. This is the new version of this. This is not yet published. This is still in the beta. This is still in the developmental stage. Uh, and Leonardo Gomez, are you in, in? You in this room? Yes. This is one of my many volunteers. I have, there's a couple of dozen guys that are, <laughs> that are working on this project. Over the last year or so, a handful of autodidacts, a, a handful of, of, of volunteers, aspiring taxonomists, and Leonardo here is a paleontology student himself. Uh, there's a number of people that have been working on entering species into this and entering the clades that they connect into, reviewing a number of different sources. They will typically start with something like Wikipedia and then check the, the references at the bottom and then start checking those references against each other because sometimes there are discrepancies. And when there are discrepancies, that's when it gets interesting because then you have to look, look up, the peer, to start reading the peer-reviewed papers themselves, the most recent ones, the most comprehensive ones. I spent a good deal of time working on this project. It's a, vol it's a huge amount of work. Uh, we have so far about 23,000 species entered and we are shooting for a million within a year. So, and it's not the individual species. I want you to know that there are other cladograms that currently exist that are very beautiful, that they're just so lovely to look at, but they're not a learning tool. This is not showing you the list of species like some other cladograms do, where you can just look up any species and it takes you right to that species and that's all you know. It's, so it looks like an end node with no transitions, but what we see is that all of these things are transitional. So uh, these are showing the value of what these different clades mean. For, for example, uh, far on that end, and I know you can't read it, but this is placentia. This is, you know, eutherians. This is people that are born with a placenta or anything that's born with a placenta. And then we will move on through, let me see. I can't read this myself, and I'm right next to it. Okay, so, Hold on, where is it? I'm just going to hit the button. I know that's going to put it in. Okay, so I, I, it was an unnamed clade here, but this, uh, the first note above that is called primates. Most of the clades are unnamed, and if you ever get a chance to look at this thing, it'll actually say unnamed most of the time. Because where Linnaeus had seven different categories, there's more like 70,000. I mean, it's ridiculous, so yeah. So it, it, it just did, the boxes didn't work the way he wanted it to be. Above primates, we're all primates, right? You understand what a primate is? <laughs> yeah, this is one of the criteria. Uh, they, then the next one above that is haplorines. Haplorines have a dry nose as opposed to a wet nose. Everybody, hopefully, in this crowded room has a dry nose. Then we have semiforms, close to the top here. Semiforms has another word, it's called anthropoidia. Either word means the same thing. It means monkeys in a colloquial sense. Right? That means we have two pectoral mammae, which again, everybody should have like only two, but it doesn't mean, it's okay if you have three, we don't need to see it. <laughs> but essentially, the memory, we, we classify anything, any node with all of its descendants. So, you're all monkeys. And as uh, one famous comedian said, you're a fucking monkey mate. And I love this. <laughs> when the creationist said, well, you think we came from monkeys, you know, why is there still monkeys? And I'm like, well, why are you still a monkey? And we can prove that. Now, in the next one, we have the monkeys divided between Caterini and Platterini. And this is contentious. There are scientists who have were taught the same way that I was, that you don't call people or their ancestors monkeys. That's just a tradition. You just don't do that. But cladistics is kind of overturning that. And I held to this position the way that I was taught that, that, that apes are not monkeys. Right, and that only some monkeys are monkeys and other monkeys are not monkeys because what that's poly, that's paraphyletic, right? You're making exceptions for certain ones and taxonomy doesn't make any sense anymore. So somebody eventually beat my head into the floor enough that I finally had to concede that, yeah, you're right, we're all fucking monkeys. <laughs> so Caterini, Platterini, Platterini, uh, these are the new world monkeys and they have splayed nostrils pointing out like this. This is one of the most distinctive features, although most of their features are actually older than the old world monkeys. They're more primitive than the old world monkeys. The new world monkeys have downward pointing noses. Y'all have downward pointing noses. And uh, they have a reduction of claws, so they're now all just dealing with flat fingernails. Oh, and fingerprints, which is another distinctive trait. And tails are reduced or absent, which is another distinctive trait. Now going from Caterini, we have plenty of different species here. Click one more down. Okay, now, uh, this cer the, up the top, Cercopithecoidea. This is the monkeys that we have today. And a lot of people have a lot of trouble with this because they want to say that apes are one group, that's hominoidea, and then all the old world monkeys are Cercopithecoidea and never the twain shall meet. But they're missing this middle group. 
Propliopithecoidea, which was an older group from which both the modern monkeys and the apes descend. So if the ancestors of apes and monkeys were both what paleoprimatologists would call a monkey, then we're monkeys. And likewise, how could old world monkeys and new world monkeys be descended from something that wasn't a monkey itself, right? Okay, so down here toward the bottom you have hominoidea, that's, that's apes. And then just above that we have hominidae, that's great apes, I think I can expand that. Did I go the wrong way? I did that, okay. Hominoidea, these are apes. Now we include in our cladogram all the fossils that anybody is aware of. So there's one in here, is it in this group? Yes, Dryopithecus is this massive group. I have 10 minutes? Okay. <laughs> Dryopithecus is a massive group of, uh, that they, they give like a one junk taxon name for 40 different species at least that are known that are all precursors of chimpanzees, of gorillas, of humans and so forth. Uh, and I'm going to be doing a video on those upcoming. But to, to give you an idea that we're covering all of the extinct species that we're aware of. And of course this gets into humanity as well. This is hominidae, those are the great apes. And then above that is hominidae, this is the human apes. These are the ones that, walk, that are, we traditionally recognize as walking around like people. However, one of the misconceptions that a lot of people have is that the apes started out as knuckle walkers and then stood up at some point. But if you look at the lesser apes, like gibbons and such, and some of the older apes like uh, orangutans and such, they were bipedal to begin with. It was easier to be bipedal in the trees because their arms are so ridiculously long when they're down on the ground, it's actually easier to walk around with your arms up like this. So there was never the knuckle walking stage. Chimpanzees and gorillas reverted to that. To go back to quadruped, we were never in that stage. So we, we've been upright walking since, since we were apes. The transition from monkey to ape, by the way, paleoprimatologists describe Aegyptopithecus as an ape-like monkey and proconsul as a monkey-like ape. So <laughs> that's how we come to that division. Now, and you saw all the people up there in this that, that top cluster, that's all hominin. This is the different species of humanity that have previously existed. And we are now, that we were, uh, we were multiple races about 30, 40,000 years ago. We are now all one race with only the slightest variance in color. There is, no, there is no quality to the statement of race in a taxonomic scheme at all. Now, these are from some of the people, the front of my admin, Steve Owens. Uh, he's uh, been stellar at putting things together. He just wanted to come up with a number of different ways that our computer system could render these, uh, these uh, data sets. And some of these are possible with the computer system that we have, with the database that we have. It can just be rendered any number of ways. And I just wanted to include some of his slides because I thought many of them were pretty. We can't use all of them because some of them are obviously hand-drawn illustrations and so forth. But we do want to have illustrated depictions eventually. This one is possible. This one we can actually render. Uh, so is that one, and this one, and this one. <laughs> and let's see, this is one of the illustrations. We'll skip that. Skip, obviously, that one we can't use. Can't use that. Uh, they make nice cover pages. And this is another computer-generated one. And then let's get into the one that I want. We can't, nobody can make sense out of this, so we're not going to use that. <laughs> and nobody can understand that either, but it looks like an album cover from the 70s. Uh, and our database engineer who put this together is this is the one that he favors. And so we've made this kind of a logo, although we've discovered that it doesn't print well on t-shirts. And now this one, which I think is amusing, because this is dogs, right? This gives an idea that all these dogs come from a common ancestor. Well, that's the way we see it. Of course, the creationists, the science deniers, will all say that they're all the dog kind, right? And remember that there's a, there's a few hundred recognized breeds, according to the American Kennel Club. So there's hundreds of different breeds of dogs and all come from a common source. And it comes down to genetically four different lineages, all derived from, not one common answer, but four, all derived from Asiatic wolves. But the story of dogs is a lot more complicated than that. And this cladogram will help to illustrate that. We'll go back to placentia where we started before. This is our common ancestor with dogs. This is what we, we looked at the primates before. Now we're gonna be looking at dogs. Uh, let me see, where are they? This is such fine print. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna find our way to carnivora. There we go. We haven't got into the heavy stuff yet. <laughs> well, this is the division of Feliforma and Caniforma. This is the cats and the dogs. The creationist argument being, you've never seen a cat give birth to a dog. 
But it's not just cats and dogs. And then they'll ask, and if the, if the people that were at the event yesterday, there was this guy who handed out pamphlets, right? At, uh, the, one of these creationists who's asking these questions of what kind of species do we have that exist today that represent these transitions? There they are. These are the ones, many of these are alive today. For example, uh, hyenas are a transition, as we mentioned before. They're neither cats nor dogs or something in between, and they're worse than that. They are actually a derivative of banded civets. And nobody even knows what a civet is in the United States, but the civet is a transitional species. It's a quasi-weasel cat. <laughs> and then you have pole cats, meerkats, and bear cats, and pole cats are also a kind of a weasel cat dog, which gets a little confusing. And then down here in the bottom, we're going to be looking just at the dogs. That first category on the bottom, that's Caniformia, and that's divided behind, between the Amphicyonids, which are bear dogs, literally, and there's also a dog bear that's a separate species. But then there's a whole family of bear dogs, which you can imagine what they look like. They're all, they're all planted green. They look like giant wolverines. But they're, they're, take a dog, take a bear, mix them together. They're not that far apart. And then, uh, let's see, what is it, Arctoidea, that's bears, that's the one on the bottom. And then Canidae, these are what we would recognize as dogs. And if we explore that, Caniformia, up here toward the top, Amphicyonids. I love these. Nobody in America knows what they are. Most people are not aware of these. You have Myocids, which are these little dog-like weasel things that still have hands, like raccoons, right, Procyonids. Because at one point, dog ancestors wander, wandered around in trees and had prehensile hands. That's why raccoons still have them. And that's why red pandas still have hands, right? So they're the cutest animals in the world because they have hands. Whereas dogs specialized, so they lost their thumb, uh, they became a useless dewclaw, which is a vestigial, uh, vestigial trait, which creationists insist does not exist. And they became digigrade, where they're up on their toes, which gives them a bit more spring. So dogs lost the ability to manipulate things in exchange for the inability to go way fast. So. In the Amphicyonid group, they have high-speed predator dogs. They've now become super predators. And the thing about Amphicyonid is we just saw one a couple days ago in the, in the Los Angeles Museum. If you haven't been, you should see it. They, they have an Amphicyonid called um, Epicyon, epic dog. And it, if it stood up on its hind legs, it'd be over seven feet tall and 300 pounds and run 40 miles an hour. And this is a pre-human dog that has, it's, do it's a dog, it's not derived from a wolf. It has no domestication, no familiarity with people at all. You are slow moving meat. <laughs> and, it just, and it's huge. And it's so much worse than a bear. I don't know why they're extinct. They were awesome. <laughs> <laughs> And this gets into it, 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 one of these groups here. Uh, we have uh, all of these divisions, like Volpini, that's where foxes are, and the Amphicyonids are actually more distantly related to modern dogs than, than foxes are. And then within dogs, you have dogs that can't be interbred. There's a lot of different species of wild dog that a lot of people don't know about, including the, uh, the, uh, the painted African wild dog, which is genetically distinct, and so distinct from domestic dogs, they can't be interbred. So any creationist arguing dog kind has to give up on Lacaya and Pictus, the African painted wild dog. And this canini, this is things that we traditionally recognize as dogs. And you see the one in red? That's Canis lupus familiaris. I highlighted it in red because there's no other way you were gonna see it. That is this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have two minutes. Okay, so I, and I, th I think I'm just about done. I just want to throw in one more thing. Uh, our, our database is entering a second phase. Now that we've got you know, tens of thousands of species already entered, and this is accelerating, we are still building on to this. Remember that the goal is to create a teaching tool. Uh, we've recently signed on all of the creators of paleos.com, which was a, a, a website dedicated to paleontology, and they, they uh, specialized in showing the, uh, the geologic time periods and the different types of fossil strata you know, recognizable for each of these different eras. This was, in its heyday, a valuable tool for paleontologists around the world. A actual scientists were using this tool, and they will be using this as well. Our goal is to get this peer reviewed. Our goal is to get scientists involved in the, in the maintenance of this thing and eventually become, you know, essentially our gift to science. This is what we're trying to do. And we're the second stage. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
The second stage of this concept is to, to throw little illustrations as signposts for people who don't know what any of these complicated main, names mean so that they know where they're navigating. And anytime you click on any of these little boxes that you may not be able to see beneath each of these names, you get an encyclopedic page with all the necessary details or data that you need to see about any particular clade. Remember, not, we're not talking about the end species. We're talking about what does it mean to be a deuterostome, right? It means your asshole developed before your mouth did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, and, and what does it mean to be a vertebrate? Of course, you have uh, vertebrae. What does it mean to be a mammal? You have memories, you know, and all of these criteria so that people understand. But the one thing that this teaches that a lot of the others don't is that, you know, when you may use some other navigation tool, some other cladogram, it'll show you all these species, but it won't show you why they are where they are. And that's the part that teaches evolution. That's the part that gets you to understand how one thing becomes another. And it's never a division. But it, it, it never changes from one kind to become another kind. You can't grow out of your ancestry, right? So whatever you are, whatever your ancestors were, even if you're something, they were not. So you may be a new category your parents don't belong to, but you still belong to the same category as all your ancestors did. And one last thing, you can also support me. <laughs> I'm, I like Matt Delahoney, I'm also a full-time activist, have been for the last three years. This is one of many projects that we do. My wife and I write uh, uh, science uh, videos teaching biology to middle school and high school kids. We do a number of activism videos and a number of other things related to secularism and also the promotion of science. So I'm trying to get you know, a, you know, a couple hundred people to donate one dollar per video would be fantastic because this is the way we make our living, this is the only income I have, so I'm going to pitch for that and Matt will do the same as you'll see. Thank you very much. I'm done. <laughs> yes, I think. Who of you are more convinced of evolution than you were when you came here? No, Rex, wait a couple of hands. I need to be more careful about my question asking. We do have time for questions, so it, I'm sure you have many questions. We're looking for information seeking questions, so make sure your question is in the form of a question. Uh, no heckling, unless it's Ernst heckling, we'll allow that. Uh, <laughs> no? I'm going to use that joke here. All right, any questions for Arnie? Yes. Uh, is this chart available online now? It is not published yet. We are looking for sponsorship. And I've talked to uh, at least one university about this already. And when they thought it was just a web page or something like that, or maybe a website, they said, yeah, sure, we'll host it. And as soon as I began to describe what it is, they said, whoa, 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 that's too big for this tiny university. So I'm sending out pitches to a number of different organizations. I would, I would happily pitch to American Atheists if they were capable of doing it. I've got a number of other, uh, like the Origins Project and a number of other such affiliations saying, would you host this learning tool? Because we want it to be something that, let me, let me put it to you, that if we found an entrepreneur who was willing to invest heavily in the creation of this thing, who, found, who paid for the database engineer to spend a year and a half working on this and all of that, but then he realized that this is a project that can't just be held in one of his businesses. It has to be something that survives him and his heirs and wouldn't be subject to litigation. So it needs to be something that becomes independent of whoever initially financed it. So we'd like to turn it over to a university if we can get one to host it or some similar organization where it will remain in perpetuity. I don't know if it would be appropriate to say. <laughs> there, there was a university, a small university in Minnesota that, that said it was too big for their, their small department and that I should maybe look to a bigger university. So we're preparing a presentation to try, and this video may be part of that, to say, would, I haven't yet. I've sent out some mailers, but I haven't gotten any responses because that was just before we began this trip. I was hoping to be able to announce that it was now going to be hosted, but as I said, once they heard the description, they said, no, this is going to be too big and it's going to be too busy and you're going to have all this server space that you're going to have. You're going to have to have four dedicated servers and all like this. And I, I don't know anything about that. I would have thought it's just a web page or a website and how big a deal could that be? But when they talk about the volume and the, the usage of it, it would actually require a little bit more than what that university could handle. I'm sorry to say. Anyway, uh, back to the back. Um, have you attempted to ask uh, the U University of California Museum of Paleontology for help? I have not yet, but if I knew anybody with connections there. <laughs> <I> <laughs>
Uh, but I, yeah, I'd be happy to if you can, if you can help me arrange who to talk to. All right, yeah, I'll try. All right, anyone else? <coughs> yes. Is the term transitional forms even something like when you're discussing this with creationists and they say show me the transitional form? Yes, they're using a very dis a very specific definition, and I actually found a young Earth creationist website that uses a, a strict definition that is the same as scientists will use. Now, there, you can say that we're all transitional species if you like, but there's, a, there's like a handful of criteria to be an actual transitional species recognized as such. Uh, and I, I believe it or not, I can't remember what those criteria are at the moment, but I, I was talking to this Young Earth Creationist website and I, I said, okay, here's the criteria they put down. I agree, this is actually valid. These are the correct descriptions. And here are 300 fossils that meet your description. And they refuse to acknowledge any of them because that would be a slippery slope such that they would have to admit evolution. Well, yeah, I know. So you're telling me <laughs> you have to lie on purpose and tell people that they're not there when you know that they're there. Just to let you know, this is on public record that you're lying and you know it. And yeah, they had no problem with that. So, and yeah. Whoa. So the, the video where I did that was uh, the ninth foundational falsehood of creationism. And I show, I think, about 400 transitional species in that video. Yeah, but one in the back here? Yes. Uh, yes, is your series on the systematic classification of life almost uh, complete? Oh, no. <laughs> yes, we're taking time. Yeah, what we're doing with the systematic classification of life video series, this was my wife's idea because this, this is what worked for her. Now, it doesn't work for everybody. Data doesn't work. You know, facts don't work for everybody, but some people will be honest, you know, and some people want to understand. And uh, when I met my wife, it was on a Christian forum. <laughs> She was an old earth creationist, and I told her that I could prove evolution to her satisfaction. And while I've made this challenge many, many times, the response is usually, no, you can't, no, you can't, no, you can't. And, excuse me, I gotta go. But my, my, uh, <laughs> my then Christian friend uh, stayed throughout the duration, and we went through all of these steps from the earliest or the most basic uh, phylogenetic classifications on up to get to her to understand why she's a eukaryote, why she's a deuterostome, why she's a vertebrate, and so on, all of these different clades. And eventually she accepted that, yeah, evolution's a thing, it's real. And surprisingly, uh, the reaction, when you, when you live in Odessa, Texas, and you tell people, no, I, I actually understand that evolution's a real thing, everybody ostracizes you. So that kind of drove us together and we became married. <laughs> Just so you know what happens when you lose an argument to me. Hi, <laughs> thanks yes. for uh, being here. Uh, my question is about the way the taxonomy works at just the most basic level, right? Oh, there he is. Okay. Uh, I mean, when is the decision made to group, um, you know, a certain set of animals or mammals or, or, or organisms into a group, and who decides on the taxonomy? How much consensus there need to be for that decision? Well, they do it by, and Leonardo might be able to give a better answer at this than me, because he's one of those uber nerds who knows way more than I probably ever will. <laughs> but it's a derived synapomorphies where you have, uh, people will, uh, will work out all these different points. They have a number of different phylogenetic points on the shape and per, of any process or a bone protrusion or whatever. Uh, all, ev all evolution is just a change in proportion, whether it's physical or, or chemical. And uh, so they, they will measure out these to come up with what conclusions could have been derived from an ancestor and they'll find these traits recurring in other similar species and they'll see a pattern of development, right? Um, and sometimes there's contentions, like for example, it was once classified that mega bats, the big bats, the fruit bats, were considered so closely, they were so similar to primates, especially like uh, basal primates like colugos, that it was decided that bats were primates, or at least the big bats. And then the microbats, the little insectivorous bats, were a different lineage that were just convergently you know, winged the same way. But then we got the genetics back, and it turns out that no, the, all bats are bats, and none of them are primates. So the mistakes can be made. And that's why you have the genome, because now it's a twin nested hierarchy, where it used to be classified only by morphology, by physical traits. We can now reverse it the other way with the genetics to confirm you are the father. So, <laughs> okay. 
Thank you very much, everyone.